Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and then continue from where we left off. Uh, so let's see, last time um, we showed, uh, yeah, so last time we showed that a group had property T, if and only if the group von Neumann algebra had property T. Then we showed a group had a Hegger property, if and only if the group von Neumann, uh, group von Neumann algebra had Hegger property. And I told you we were going to obtain this corollary, which is that uh, these, well, I mean, we get this automatically that they're not isomorphic, but the stronger part, in fact, uh, PSL3Z cannot even embed into PSL2Z. So to get that corollary, we're going to need one uh, lemma, which is a basic lemma from von Neumann algebras. So I'll mention this. So uh, this is the lemma that um, if you have m tau, a tracial uh, von Neumann algebra, and you have b, a von Neumann subalgebra, so then there exists uh, a conditional expectation E mapping M to B, and this is a trace preserving conditional expectation. What do I mean by conditional expectation? I mean that it is uh, a um, UCP uh, item potent and B bimodular, meaning that if you have uh, E of B1 X B2, this is the same as E of B1 X B2, and this is for B1 B2 and B and X and B. Uh, actually, the UCP item potent already implies B by modular, but I'll just have it as an extra assumption because it'll be explicit from the proof of the lemma. Um, so let me go ahead and prove this. So here we have a tracial von Neumann algebra. So remember, we're always assuming the trace is normal, uh, uh, faithful. Uh, so we have the standard representation. So we'll go ahead and think of M as sitting inside of bounded operators on L2 of M. And then we can consider this. Um, uh, so we know that M is not only does it sit inside of bounded operators on L2, but it's also a dense subspace of L2 itself. This is like how L infinity functions on a probability space, you can think of them as operators on L2 functions, or you can think of them as a subset of L2 functions. And that's the same for any tracial von Neumann algebra. Uh, so in particular for B, the von Neumann subalgebra, we can also uh, look at what its image is in the L2 space. And we'll let E sub B, this is little e, so this is going to denote the orthogonal projection uh, from L2 of M tau uh, to, well, its image, what will its image be? But its image will canonically be isomorphic to L2 of B tau, to L2 of B tau. Right, this is naturally a subspace of this by just restricting to the closure of B. And we'll let E sub B denote this orthogonal projection. Uh, so then what can we do? So then we just notice, um, uh, so then the claim, yeah, here's the claim is that we define now E, define E, so this is going to map M and initially this is going to map it into bounded operators on L2 of B. And this is going to be by E of X is just EB X EB. 
right? So EB, we can, this is the orthogonal projection on the L2 of B, so we can view this operator as just an operator in L2 of B. Uh, and this defines a map from M to bounded operators on L2 of B. And the claim is that this map uh, satisfies uh, the conclusion. This map is a conditional expectation. So the claim is that E is uh, our conditional expectation. Meaning that it is trace preserving, is unital completely positive. Well, the fact that it's unital completely positive is obvious because it's just a conjugation map. And we know that conjugation preserves is completely positive. And clearly, if you take the identity element, then you get the identity element in B of L2. So it's unital completely positive. It's also clearly an item potent because if you apply it twice, you use the fact that EB is a projection. So applying EB, conjugating by EB twice is the same as conjugating by once. So it's certainly an item potent. Uh, UCP, uh, it's also normal. Maybe I should have put, a, put all that as well, but that also follows from trace preserving. So maybe normal also put. Um, uh, and uh, so the only two things to check are that it's trace preserving and that it actually maps into B because as we've defined it, it only maps into B of L2. Right, so let's go ahead and check these two facts. I'll we'll have to move on to a new page for this. Uh, so we have to show that it maps into B, and once we show that, we have to show that it preserves the trace. So to show that it maps into B, what we're gonna show is that it commutes with everything that commutes with B. And this is good because we have an explicit description of the commutant of B, it's just J, B, J. Right, so all we have to do is now fix X and M and B and B, and we'll consider um, J, B, J, uh, and E of X. And now we want to compute what this is, so we'll apply it to an element in, in L2, and then we'll take the inner product, so we're gonna need also uh, C and D, say, and B. And then we're gonna apply this to C hat and D hat, and we're gonna see what we get. All right, so let's go ahead and do this computation. So this is just the JBJ. We can move to the other side, and we get that this is then uh, EB, X, EB, C hat. And here we have D, and then it's, uh, well, J, B star J, which is just right multiplication by B, so DB. So we get this. Now EB is just the orthogonal projection onto L2 of B, but here C and D and B are already in B, so EB doesn't do anything. So this is just X C hat DB hat, which is just, um, if you like, this is just the trace of B star D star XC. All right, so we get this formula. But now let's compute also what is EX JBJ C hat D hat. And for this, uh, we compute this and we see that now this is EB X EB. And now we have JBJ as right multiplication by B star. So it's CB star hat D hat. And again, this is already in B, this is in B, so the EBs, we can drop them, and this is nothing but the trace of D star X C B star. And now we compare these two things and we see that indeed they're equal by the trace property. Uh, and this happened for all C and all D, which form a dense subspace of L2. So the conclusion we get is therefore this EX actually lives in J, B, J prime, intersect B of L2 of B tau, which is B. Let me prove before that that's exactly B. Uh, okay, so that shows that this maps into B, and finally we show that it preserves the trace, uh, but that's easy enough to do because if X is an M, then the trace of EX, so now this is the trace in B. Well, we can rewrite that as just E X 
one hat, one hat. Uh, the trace is given by this cyclic vector, one hat. But now we plug in the definition of EX, and that's just EV, but one is in B, so this is the same as X, one hat, one hat, which is the trace of X. So that shows that it preserves the trace. One quick question. Yes. Could you repeat why does the, like the leftmost EV disappear from line to line? Uh, that's because this is a projection, so I'm, it's a projection, so I'm moving it to the other side to take its Oh, identity. okay, okay, I understand. And then find it's a D, but D is in B, so it's the identity on D. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks. Maybe I should have added one more equality to be clear. Okay, so now from this lemma, now the corollary follows immediately because uh, as a consequence, you get, uh, so this is the corollary, you get that if, if M has the Hegra property, and B in M is a von Neumann subalgebra, sub So then uh, B has the aggregate property. And why is this? This is because, uh, remember the Hagrid property just meant that we had these uh, UCP maps. So these map M to M, they're unital, completely positive, uh, normal, subtracial, and we had that phi n of x minus x and norm two goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and this is for x and m. And we also had that the corresponding operator, so we know they, got, they gave us contractions on L2, and these were in fact compact operators on L2 then. So that was the definition of the Hagra property. But now all we do is just uh, we restrict this phi n to b, and then this gives us a map from b to m, and then we compose with the conditional expectation. So we can consider uh, phi n compose the conditional expectation restricted to b, and now this maps b to b. Again, UCP normal subtracial because we know that the conditional expectation is trace preserving. Uh, and uh, the other thing we know is that we still have, so the E, e n of B minus B, well, because B is in B, and remember I said that E is bimodular, oh, you should have checked that as well, but that's easy to check that this E, the E B, Right, it's easy to check that B commutes with EB and hence, uh, and hence this expectation will be B by, B by module. Uh, so this means we can put uh, B inside here. And again, since E is a, a completely positive map that's trace preserving, this is a contraction on L2. So this is less than or equal to Pn of B minus B, which goes to zero. And then finally, you just check that what is uh, T of E compose EN restricted to B. And you just check this. This is just EB, T, EN, EB. So it'll again be in compact operators because it's a compression of a compact operator. So it'll again be compact. Um, so that shows that uh, if you have a von Neumann subalgebra of, of something with the Hager property, then you have the Hager property, and that uh, finishes that argument that I gave you, that in fact, uh, SL3Z, the von Neumann algebra can't even embed inside of SL2Z or, or free group factor, because we know free groups also have Hager property, uh, et cetera. Or this uh, wreath product of uh, Z with F2. That was another example we showed as Hagger property. So SL3Z can't even embed in there, for instance. All right, so this is pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, another uh, 
maybe nice application of property T to von Neumann algebras, I want to give you two more applications. Uh, so one is this uh, theorem of Kahn, I believe from 1980, which is that if M is a, a 2 1 factor with property T, Uh, so two one factor. I don't know if we've introduced this, but two one factor just means that you're trace, you're tracial, you are a factor, meaning you have trivial center, and uh, you're infinite dimensional, so you're not a matrix algebra. So that's all I mean by a two one factor. Uh, M is a two one factor with property T. Uh, so then, the outer automorphism group of M is countable. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove this. And this is, again, something very far from, say, free group factors, um, where you can show that, um, uh, so if you, if you take any, so I mean, or think about it for the integers. So if you take the integers, take its group von Neumann algebra, then this is the outer automorphism of this is, well, it's the same as a whole automorphism. And this course is completely wild because it's just L infinity of the torus. So there are many, many automorphisms of this. And for a free group factor, you can take free products of automorphisms. And so also for free group factors, there are many, many outer automorphisms. But in contrast, property T factors, there are not so many, there are only countably many. Uh, so the proof of this is the first thing to notice is that the automorphism group of M. Uh, so one fact I'll use, so this uh, one of this one case where we use that it's a factor, is that uh, factors have unique traces. So note, I should have mentioned this when I did the survey of, of von Neumann algebras if I didn't. I, th I think maybe I did. And that is that two one factors have unique traces. Yeah, I did. I definitely mentioned this. And this is something uh, I'll use. Um, so uh, what can we do if we consider the automorphism uh, group of M? Uh, so then this has a natural Polish topology. So this is, oh, I should have remarked here also that, uh, so, let me add, let me add separable here. Uh, property T implies separable, but I don't want to prove that. So I'll just add that as a condition. And that separable means that L2 of it is separable. Uh, of course, no, you know, no infinite dimensional von Neumann algebra will be separable as a C star algebra. So when we talk about separable von Neumann algebras, we mean that it has separable pre-dual or that it acts on a separable Hilbert space. This, this is what we mean. Uh, so the remark I want to make is that automorphism, the automorphism group of N is a Polish group uh, under uh, or with, with the topology of pointwise weak operator topology convergence. So IE alpha I converges to alpha if, um, if alpha I of X minus alpha of X converges to zero uh, weak operator topology for all X and so this is a natural, um, uh, Polish topology. Actually, because there's automorphisms, uh, the weak pointwise weak operator topology is going to be the same as, um, pointwise strong operator topology. Uh, so let me make sure what I'm saying is not nonsense. Uh, so note, 
if alpha i converges to alpha point weak operator topology. So then for uh, x in m, I want to look at what is alpha i x minus alpha x to norm squared. And uh, what is this? Well, this is going to be, uh, so again, we'll just expand this out. So this is alpha i x to norm squared plus alpha x to norm squared minus twice the real part of the inner product of alpha i x alpha x. Uh, but automorphisms, uh, if you compose an automorphism with the trace, you get another trace. And two one factors have unique traces. So automorphisms preserve the trace, and therefore they give you not just contractions, but even unitaries on L2. So here, this is nothing but the norm of x in norm 2 plus the norm of x in norm 2 squared minus twice the real part of alpha i x alpha i. And you see, because alpha i is converging weak operator topology to x, so this is with respect to the trace, uh, therefore this is converging to the norm squared of alpha x, which is again the norm 2 squared of x, so this all goes to 0 as i goes to infinity. So just having that they converge, these alpha i's converge point weak operator topology actually implies that they converge point strong operator topology. So that's something unique about automorphisms. Uh, and that's good because automorphisms are uh, unital completely positive maps in particular, and here's the norm two topology. So this looks like the setup for property T, and indeed it is. So what we're gonna show So the claim is that the inner automorphisms of M uh, is an open subgroup. Of, uh, uh, this claim proves the theorem because then we have that their quotient well, open subgroups, this is true for any topological group. An open subgroup is automatically a closed subgroup. And then the quotient uh, will be a discrete Polish group. Is a discrete Polish group. But discrete Polish group is the same as a countable group. Right? So this is just a countable discrete group. All right, so that's why the claim proves the theorem. So we just need to show that the inner automorphism group is an open subgroup. So let's go ahead and prove the claim. So the proof of the claim. So we'll suppose uh, by, so we'll suppose we have some sequence alpha i's of ought such that alpha i converge to alpha and this alpha is in the inner automorphism. And we have to show that uh, eventually these alpha i's become inner. Right? So if we can approximate an inner automorphism, then eventually we are an inner automorphism. That's what it means for the inner automorphism to be an open, open subgroup. All right, so notice that this is inner. So let's say it's say add u for some u. So one simplification is that then we get, then if we look at add u star, compose alpha i, let me call this uh, maybe beta i, beta i, well this converges then to the identity uh, automorphism. So this makes our life a little bit easier. And of course beta i is inner if and only if alpha i is inner, so it's enough just to check that beta i is eventually inner. Okay, so what do we know about that? We know that um, but it converges the identity, and like I showed, pointwise weak operator topology is the same as strong operator topology, same as norm, norm two topology. So we have the therefore uh, beta i of x minus x 
and norm two converges to zero as i tends to infinity, and this is for all x and m. But automorphisms are in particular completely positive maps and trace preserving uh, and normal. So therefore, uh, what do we have? We have that we are in the setting of property T. So property T says we therefore have uniform convergence. So property T implies that the soup over X and the uniball of M, this is the uniform uniball of beta I X minus X and norm two goes to zero as I goes to one. So eventually this will be less than say one half less than or equal to one half on the uniball. Uh, and so let's suppose, suppose that we have that this is less than one half. Suppose x and m, beta i x minus x is less than or equal to one half. Uh, maybe I'll need one fourth or something like that, but one half, let's try, try this and see what happens. Uh, and I claim that this uh, condition implies that beta i is an inner automorphism. So let's go ahead and do that. So how are we going to do that? We'll consider, so we'll fix, now we'll just fix i. So, uh, and we consider this set uh, case of, it'll depend on i, I guess, which is going to be the convex whole of beta i u u star. This is just a u is a unitary in m. And the convex hole I'm going to take as norm two closed convex hole. So this is some, some subset of L2 of m tau. Uh, but one remark is that, of course, um, the uh, everything here Everything here is contained in the uniball of M, the uniform uniball of M. And the uniform uniball of M is closed in L2. And so therefore, this is actually contained in M. So we took some closure, which is in L2, but we actually stayed inside of M because we stayed inside the uniball, and the uniball is closed, a closed subset of L2. Right, where we're thinking of M as living inside here. So maybe I should write M hat, meaning that we're inside M, thinking of it as a subspace of L2. Uh, okay, so here we have a norm closed convex uh, subset of a Hilbert space. Now we've done this argument before that there's therefore an element of unique minimal norm. So we let Z, I guess this, depends on i, but let me forget about i because I don't want to write i. Uh, z in case of i be the unique element of minimal norm 2. And that's just a general Hilbert space fact. We've used that before. An enclosed convex subset of a Hilbert space has a unique element of minimal norm. Um, uh, so then what do we know about the z? We have that if we look at if if v is a unitary of m, so then we have that beta v beta i v k v star is actually equal to this set k k i. Right, if we multiply by beta i v on the left, we'll see it's an automorphism. So we just get beta i v u, and on the right, we get u star v star. And so that's just a change of variables. So this map, which is multiplication by beta i v on the left and multiplication by v star on the right, this takes k i into itself. And this is also a norm two preserving. Uh, and this is isometric. So we get this equality and this map is isometric. And this map which takes uh, some vector w or this map which takes x and sends it to beta i v x v star is isometric. 
because multiplying on a unitary on the right preserves the norm two, but also multiplying by a unitary on the left also preserves the norm two. Uh, so this is an isometric map from Ki to Ki, uh, and hence it's going to preserve the, ele the unique element of minimal norm. So we get the therefore beta i v z v star has to equal z. Well, now we can multiply by v on the right, and we get a therefore beta i v z is equal to z v, and this was for all v unitary in m. And finally, we can use the fact that this formula is now linear as a function of v. And every element in a uh, von Neumann algebra is a linear combination of unitaries. Uh, this is, in fact, true for general C star algebra. Every element of a C star of a unitable C star algebra is a span of at most four unitaries. Uh, so we can write this. So we get the therefore beta i x z is equal to z x, and this is for all x and m. Uh, all right, now the next thing uh, I want to remark is that this formula in particular, if we take adjoints of it, so we can take adjoints of it and we can get the therefore also z, z star beta i x is equal to x z star for all x and n. I just took an adjoint of the formula before it and I replaced x with x star since it was an arbitrary element. But now we can combine these two things and we get that uh, therefore, if we look at um, X, if we look at the Z star, Z of X, well, we see that the first formula tells us that this is Z star beta I X Z. But then the second formula tells us that this is uh, uh, yeah, so this is x, z star, z. So what we get is that z star z lives in m, but it also commutes with m, so that's the center. And we're assuming this is a factor, so this is the scalars. Now the next thing I claim is that it's not zero. So why isn't it zero? And that's because everything in Ki, so we, have, we haven't used anywhere this condition, so we're gonna use this now. Everything in Ki satisfies uh, this. So note uh, that by this star, this condition star, that star, from star we have that beta i u, u star minus one in norm two, this is equal to beta i u minus u in norm two is less than or equal to one half, and this is for all unitaries. So therefore, if we take convex whole, if we take convex sums of this thing on the left, we also get that it's less than or equal to one half. And then by taking the closure, uh, we get that as well. So in fact, we get that note that uh, for all, uh, say, X, or I don't want to use X, for all K and Ki, we have that the norm two from Ki to one is less than or equal to one half. So therefore, in particular for Z, so therefore the distance from Z to one in norm two is less than one half which implies that z is not zero, because then that would be one instead of one half. So really all we needed was just any number less than one here, we would have been fine. Uh, but this shows that z is not uh, zero, so therefore, but z star times z, it's in the scalars, but it, in fact it's a positive number, so it has to be a positive scalar, and that means that z is just a, a multiple of a unitary. So we get that therefore, there exists some lambda, a complex number, such that lambda times z, uh, such that uh, let's call this w, w equals lambda times z is a unitary.
because E star Z is in the scalars. So it says that uh, this is a, well, it says, it says it's an isometry, but we're in a finite von Neumann algebra, so isometries are the same as unitaries. Professor, can I ask something? Yes. So it's, um, Z was this element of minimal norm, so Z star will have the same two norm as Z, right? That's true, yeah. Therefore, Z is equal to Z star, so your argument uh, actually- No, 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 because uh, while taking adjoints is an isometry in norm two, it doesn't preserve Ki. Ah, okay. No, we can't, we can't conclude that Z star is equal to Z. Uh, but we do conclude that Z star Z is a scalar, a non-zero scalar, and so we can multiply it and get this W, which is a unitary. And of course, this W will still satisfy this, uh, Equality, so we have beta i x times w is equal to w x for all x and m. And now, of course, multiplying by w star, we get the therefore this automorphism beta i is just add w, so which is an inner automorphism. So that finishes the proof of the claim and therefore the proof of the theorem. So um, yeah, so this is a nice, this is the first uh, rigidity results that uh, we have in von Neumann algebra due to Alan Kahn in 1980. And so this sort of, you know, saying that it's not, this first hint that von Neumann, the world of von Neumann algebra is not quite as wild as like um, L of Z, which is just L infinity of your favorite probability space. All right, so another application I'll mention, but I won't prove if you know what the fundamental group is. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. This proof they claim that the uh, inner automorphism are an open subgroup. And how does this show that? Uh, that's because now while well, open subgroups are automatically closed, so it's also a closed subgroup. And the quotient group is a Polish group because whenever you have a Polish group, the quotient by a closed subgroup is a Polish group. But because in the inner group is automorphism, it's a discrete Polish group. And discrete Polish groups are countable. Polish means separable. Or Polish implies separable. Pol Polish means that it's uh, a complete separable metric space, or has uh, completely, it's completely metrizable and separable. Right, so I skipped, I skipped the proof of why this is Polish. I just stated it as fact. And that's because it's not a particularly interesting proof, but you have to sit down and do it. Uh, and it just uses the fact that M is separable. That's all it, all it uses. Of why the automorphism group is, is a separable, separable Polish group. The fact that it's a topological group is pretty easy to check with this topology. Uh, but to see that it's separable takes us, you know, a little bit of argument, but it's it's not. It's pretty easy. All right. Uh, yeah, so I was gonna say that uh, a slight extension of this, which I won't prove, but I'll just state as fact, um, so that if you know the fundamental group of a 2-1 factor, you have that the fundamental group, the fundamental group of a 2-1 factor naturally injects into the uh, outer automorphism group of M tensor uh, N. And you can also, another fact, which is maybe not quite obvious from what we've done so far, but almost obvious. Uh, and another fact is that uh, property T is stable under tensor products. Uh, so if M has T, so then M tensor M has T. Uh, for groups, this really is obvious. Uh, I'll let you think about it for groups. For two and factors, maybe it's not quite so obvious because um, right, it's not every uh, C UCP map here will be a tensor product of UCP maps. So there's a little bit of work you have to do. Uh, but for groups, every positive definite function on a product, you can restrict to each, each of the factors and it's positive definite function. So for groups, this is very easy. Um, uh, and then since the fundamental group embeds into this and this is therefore countable, so the corollary you get is the conclusion 
is that uh, if m is a uh, factor to one factor with uh, property t, then the fundamental group is also countable. Is countable. And based on, on this and some other evidence from, um, uh, from algebraic group theory, Kahn actually made the following conjecture. So this is Kahn uh, rigidity conjecture. He conjectured that if uh, M, well, there's, two things. Uh, so one is that, uh, so uh, two things he conjectured. So the first is that if gamma is ICC property T, uh, so ICC, I don't know if we've expanded that. This just means infinite conjugacy classes. So each non-trivial conjugacy class is infinite. And Murray and von Neumann showed that this was equivalent to the group von Neumann algebra being a factor. That's a nice exercise if you want to do it. Uh, so ICC property T, uh, so then L gamma isomorphic to L lambda implies gamma isomorphic to lambda. So this is Kahn's rigidity conjecture. Uh, and then there's another conjecture, uh, which uh, actually now that I think about it, I don't know if Kahn ever explicitly stated this one. And that is that if M is a two one factor with property T, so then the fundamental group of M should be trivial. Now, actually, maybe Khan never ex uh, stated this one um, as, as ex explicitly as a conjecture, so I probably shouldn't attribute this one to Khan. This one for sure is explicitly stated uh, by Khan in one of his papers. Uh, but the main interest here is, uh, you know, for gamma equal SL3Z, this is the main example that people care about. Uh, if, if you know, you could prove contra-rigidity conjecture for any group, any property group, it would already be fantastic. But if you could prove it for SL3Z, this is what Kahn was really thinking of when he, when he wrote out this conjecture. Uh, so this is still open. In fact, it hasn't been settled for even a single example of ICC property T group except the trivial group is an ICC property T group, and I guess that satisfies us. But other than that, uh, it hasn't been solved for any ICC property T group. Um, and nor has a counterexample been found. So this is a wide open conjecture. Uh, for this second conjecture, there are now examples of two one factors with uh, property T and trivial fundamental group. Uh, the first examples of group factors with this property were, were developed just a year or two ago um, by maybe some of the authors are in this audience, uh, I'm not sure. Um, no. uh, okay, so this is still pretty current research on this, on this topic. Uh, okay, so what do I want to discuss next? Oh, so the one other application of property T I wanted to discuss which again, let me be a little brief on this uh, because I won't use, I won't prove this quite rigorously. Uh, but another kind of fun example, so this was an observation due to, I guess, Pulpa, I believe it's in his most recent ICM uh, paper. Uh, so the example is that here you have, uh, there are known to be property T groups with infinite centers. In fact, uh, here's an explicit example, which was first noticed, I believe, by Yves de Cornulier. 
Uh, that is that if you look at this subgroup of, I guess this entry should be one, this entry should be one, and these are zeros. So if you look at this subgroup, so it's gonna consist of all matrices of this form that are in SL5Z. So you look at this group, uh, this forms a subgroup of SL5Z, and you can show that uh, this group has property T. We could, uh, so I'm not gonna give the proof, but you, we could give the proof almost uh, immediately because you have here two copies. Uh, it, here's, here you have one copy, if you look at these, this situation here, you have one copy of SL3 semi-direct product Z, Z cubed, which we know has property T. On the other hand, if you look at this rectangle right here, that gives you another copy of SL3Z semi-direct product Z cubed. And these two copies of SL3Z semi-direct product Z cubed, you can show boundedly generate this group. So that's how you show this group has property T. And this was first noticed by, uh, I believe, Yves de Cornelier. Um, and the nice thing about this group is that you can also compute its uh, center. So this group has infinite center. Uh, you can compute it. So the center of this group is gonna be isomorphic to the integers and they're just gonna be realized as the subgroup of matrices of this form. So you're gonna have a copy of the integers there and then zeros everywhere else. So it's gonna be just the top right corner, you have something, you have an integer, you have ones down the diagonals and zero everywhere else. And this gives you a copy of the integers and this is the center of this group gamma. Uh, so here's a nice example of a property T group that has infinite center. Well, what does that give? So that's not Popa's example. What's Popa's example, his observation is of course, therefore, if we look at L of this group gamma, so this has property T, uh, but this is not a factor because we have this uh, center of the group already. So certainly this uh, has a diffuse center in fact. So we can write L gamma using uh, von Neumann's you know, integral decomposition. We can write this as a direct integral over some measure space of uh, two one factors. So this is von Neumann's direct integral decomposition. And then the remark here is that this gives you another way of producing lots and lots of examples of two one factors because uh, von Neumann showed that in this direct integral decomposition, if you had some positive measure subset where they were all isomorphic, then this would give you a tensor product with L infinity. So, um, so if we had that MX were isomorphic to MY for X and Y in some subset A of X um, with the measure of A, positive. So then what you would conclude is you would conclude that L gamma, at least when you cut down by this projection, this, it's a central projection. So when you cut down by this projection, you would have that it's isomorphic to L infinity of A with mu restricted to A tensor, um, whatever, you know, whatever isomorphism class this is. So this is part of von Neumann's results that uh, if the direct integral decomposition, if they're all isomorphic, then you can make this isomorphic to tensor product. Here. And this uh, does not, definitely does not have T because uh, X is diffuse. So this will be have no atoms. So this will be non-atomic and this does not have T. which would contradict the fact that L gamma has T. So the conclusion we get is that therefore, um, 
uh, you know, this, so therefore there does not exist a positive measure subset. Mx such that Mx is isomorphic to Ny for all x and y. So that says that in this direct in integral decomposition, we really do get a whole lot of non-isomorphic uh, two one factors. Um, and yeah, so one potential research project that uh, I floated at least to one or two of my students. Uh, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it's tricky, maybe it's easy, I'm not sure. But the question is, is if you have a direct integral decomposition and you know that the direct integral decomposition has property T, like the situation here, what can you say about the equivalence relation on X given by isomorphism of the two one factors? So here's one thing we can say directly that, uh, you know, there's no positive measure subsets where, where we get, uh, you know, that one, no equivalence class can have positive measure. That's one thing we get for sure. But it seems to me that this should have a fairly, fairly rigid structure. So I think this is an interesting equivalence relation. Uh, and I'll just pose that as a, you know, question. Um, and like I said, I really have no idea if this is an easy question or a difficult question, or I, I, it could be just nobody's actually studied it. And I, I haven't had the time personally to study it. But uh, so if M has T, uh, what can be said about the equivalence relation on, um, on the center, well, it'll be the spectrum of this center, uh, or it'll be on some spectrum of the centers on X mu, in the integral decomposition. Uh, given by isomorphism. So that's just some question I don't actually know. Um, that's just a look. Uh, okay, so I think if you guys don't mind, since I'm definitely behind in my lectures, if I could take like five more minutes, uh, I want to introduce one new thing, which is, here's a definition. And this is due to Murray and von Neumann, part of their work. And that is that a uh, two one factor or uh, a Tracial von Neumann algebra M has property gamma uh, Usually nowadays it's written like this with writing out the word gamma and putting it in parentheses The parentheses because it looks similar to property T and they're writing out the word gamma because we like to use gamma for a group and so L gamma is often a von Neumann algebra and to write that L gamma has gamma is a little awkward if you use the Greek letter. So that's why it's just written out in English. Uh, so a tracial von Neumann algebra is property gamma if there exists, uh, so let me just say separable. So I don't have to talk about, well, I can just say nets, it's fine. If there exists uh, a net UI in of unitaries such that we have trace of ui is equal to zero and they asymptotically commute in norm two with every element. All right, that's property gamma. So this was uh, introduced by Murray and von Neumann. Um, and one example, and this was, uh, you know, their motivation is that um, uh, if we have M is isomorphic to N tensor product 
here R, where R is the hyperfinite to one factor. So R is some union of n by n matrices, some closure like this. Uh, so if, if M has this decomposition, then M has property gamma. So then M has property gamma. Uh, see, I've already not done it. Property gamma. And the reason for this is because, well, First of all, tensoring by n doesn't do anything because if we just let the unitaries live in R, then they'll commute with everything in n. So it's enough just to show that R itself has property gamma. And you can do this by realizing that R you can write as this uh, limit of two by two matrices. Uh, so this is the limit, some limit. I should say if you look here, you have two by two matrices, tensor two by two matrices. Uh, tensor two by two matrices. Let's say you do this n times. And so these are all tracial von Neumann algebras. And then you can take the union over all n, and then this has a trace, and then you take the GNS construction and take the completion in that GNS construction. So this is one way to construct R. And in this way, then it's very easy to see that it has property gamma because, so this is an increase in union where each time you embed the n copies into n plus one by just uh, tensor one. Right? And this is, uh, so you can just let, uh, you can take un to be one tensor one tensor one, and you do this n times. And then tensor, and now you take your favorite, say, trace zero uh, unitary, which is maybe something like, I don't know, zero, zero, one, one, something like that. That's perfectly nice trace zero unitary. And then, uh, and then tensor one, tensor one, et cetera. So this is un, and this is an element of R. And the thing to note is that this un commutes with everything that's in this uh, copy of tensor products below it. So it's then pretty easy to see that the uns, so then you get that x un, uh, so the limit is actually equal to zero. Uh, so the limit, or the, the limit is eventually equal to zero, so I'm going to say. So then is equal to zero for large n. And this is on a dense, say norm two dense, norm two dense subset of, of R. So you actually get that these unitaries genuinely commute with this increasing union of uh, matrix algebras, which is then a dense norm two in R. So therefore, you can see that uh, they'll satisfy this condition. Um, so therefore, R has property gamma, and then you tensor it with anything, you again have property gamma. So these have property gamma, whereas uh, free group factors uh, does not have property gamma. Uh, so this is something we'll prove next time. Uh, so we'll you go through a proof of Ephros where we'll show that property gamma actually implies interamenability, and then we'll prove that free, group, free groups are not interamenable. Uh, but okay, since I've already gone over a little bit, we'll have to save this, uh, save this result for Monday. All right, any questions? All right, fantastic. In that case, I'll see all of you on Monday.